All right, so today I'm going to run through paper three theory paper, which is the Cambridge IGCSE physics paper. That's code 0625, and that's paper 31. This is from May, June 2018. So let's start with that now. Question one. Model trains move along a track passing through two model stations. Students analyze the motion of a train. They start the digital timer as the train starts to move. They record the time that it enters station A and the time that it enters station B. So there we are with a couple of stopwatches with the times on them. Now, part A, calculate the time taken from the train entering station A to the train entering station B. State your answer in seconds. All right, let's look at that now. So the time it comes in to station A, it is one minute and 22 seconds has elapsed. It enters station B after two minutes and 34 seconds have elapsed. So the difference between those two times is just one minute and 12 seconds, which is 72 seconds. No, it wants the answer in seconds. B. A faster train takes 54 seconds to travel from station A to station B. The distance between the stations is 120 metres. Calculate the average speed of this train. All right, so first things first, we're going to put down the equation we need to use. Speed equals distance divided by time. Always write down your working out for these papers. Doesn't matter if you know the answer. There will be marks available for it. Look, there's three marks for working out the value of the speed. There's no way in the world that there isn't a mark for writing down the equation. Okay, so that gives us a distance of 120 metres and a time of 54 seconds. And that will give us a value of 2.2 metres per second. Part C then. Figure 1.2 shows a speed time graph for a train travelling on a different part of the track. Alright, so we've got a big old speed time graph there. And it's going to ask us, determine the total distance travelled by the train on this part of the track. Okay, it's a speed time graph. Of course, what we need to know, what we need to write down always, because we're writing down or working out, we know that the distance travelled is the area under a speed time graph. There we go. So let's go back to our graph and look at the areas. There are three areas that we want to calculate independently, because it makes our lives much easier if we do that. We've got a triangle on the one side, a triangle on the other side, and a rectangle in the middle. There we are. This is 3.5 here. So this area, area one in here, is going to be one half times 3.5 meters per second multiplied by four seconds. This area will be 3.5 meters per second multiplied by six seconds. And this one at the end, area three, will be, so again, one half multiplied by 3.5 meters per second multiplied by four seconds again. All right, so let's calculate those out. This gives me 7 metres, this gives me 21 metres, and this gives me 7 metres as well. All right, so the area under the speed time graph, that's distance travelled then equals area 1 plus area 2 plus area 3. Now if you look at the graph, I've written all my working out on the graph, so I'm okay to leave it there. You can do that as long as it's clear to read, it's clearly legible. If not, if it's not very clear, not very easy to read, write it out again down here, just to make sure that you get the marks that you deserve. So that's 7 metres plus 21 metres plus 7 metres, which gives me a value of 35 metres. So the total distance travelled from this speed time graph is 35 metres. Right. Question two. 
A 250 centimetre cubed beaker containing some liquid is shown in figure 2.1. We have an unknown volume of liquid. Okay, an unknown volume of an unknown liquid at this point. And we have a beaker. They're both labelled. A1. A student has a measuring cylinder and a balance. Describe an experiment to determine the density of the liquid. All right. Well, there's going to be a couple of equations that are going to be quite important here. One, of course, is the equation for density. Density equals mass over volume. And the other one is going to be the equation for weight. Weight equals mass times gravity. And that's because we're given a balance as well. And that will tell us the weight. So let's just scroll down and start having a look at those. All right, so weight equals mass times gravity. And density equals mass over volume. Now, if we can find the weight of the object, then we can calculate the mass. And then, if we can find the volume of the object, or in this case of the liquid, then that's all we need to calculate the density. So we have to follow through the steps to get that. Okay, so describe an experiment to determine the density of the liquid. Well, first of all, let's measure the weight of the liquid plus the beaker using the scales for the balance. Now, what we can do is we can take the beaker full of liquid and we can transfer that liquid into our measuring cylinder and that will give us the volume of the liquid. There we are. So straight away we've got one of the things we want. We wanted the volume. We've now got the volume. We can read that from the measuring cylinder. Now we still have to find the weight of the liquid. So what we can do is we can measure the weight of our beaker. And once we have the weight of the beaker, so we know that we initially used the balance to find the weight of the liquid and the beaker. Now we have the weight of the beaker. The difference between the liquid and the beaker and the beaker will give us the weight of the liquid. And then once we have the weight of the liquid, we just divide it by gravity, or the value of gravity in order to find the mass. There we are, now it gives the mass of the liquid. Now we have the mass of the liquid and we have the volume of the liquid. So we can put that straight in and calculate out the density. So the density of the liquid is just given by the mass of the liquid divided by the volume of the liquid. And there we go, that's how we'd conduct that experiment. All right, part two suggests the unit of density used by the student. Okay, we've got mass divided by volume. Now this can either be grams per centimeter cubed or it can be done in kilograms per meter cubed. Let's go on to part B. Figure 2.2 .2 shows a block of polythene. Polythene floats in water. Explain why polythene floats. Well, the only reason polythene will float in water is because the density of polythene is less than the density of water. I don't have to know the density of polythene. All I have to do is know that it floats in water. The density of anything floating in water is less than the density of the water. And there we go. Let's go on to the next section. The weight of the polythene block is 0 0.84 newtons. Calculate the mass of the block. Well, first things first, we need our equation for weight. And we've been asked to calculate the mass. It's always important to write down the equation here. Look, it's the three mark question. It's guaranteed to be one mark in there for writing down the equation you're going to use. All right, so calculate the mass of the block. Well, the mass is just given by the weight divided by gravity. If anyone's not sure about how to rearrange equations, of course, this could just be arranged into a triangle. You would have weight, mass times gravity. And of course, you cover over the one you want. We want mass. It leaves us with weight divided by gravity. All right, so let's put the information in that we have. Weight divided by gravity. 0.84 newtons divided by 10 meters per second squared, which gives us a value of 0 0.084 kilograms. Part 3. Figure 3.1 shows the vertical forces on a rocket. We have a thrust of 74.2 newtons, a weight of 70, oh sorry, a weight of 43 newtons, and a resistance of 2.4 newtons. Calculate the resultant force 
on the rocket. Okay, so resultant force on the rocket, let's look at this. We have two forces acting, really a force up and a force down. We have 74.2 newtons upwards and downwards. We have 43 plus 2.4, that's 45.4 newtons downwards. All right, so we just subtract one from the other. 74.2 minus 45.4, uh, which will give us a value Twenty-eight point eight newtons. And direction of course is upwards. Now let's be clear here, it's another three mark question, so there's going to be marks available for the working out. Always show your working out. If you don't show your working out, you're going to lose like twenty percent of the marks in any of these exams. Well, that's just for writing the equations. If you're getting marks for working out, that's probably going to go up to 40 or 50% or higher. So show your working out. B, shows uh, this figure shows the speed and direction of motion of an object at a point in time. Uh, the resultant force on the object is zero for 10 seconds. Deduce the speed and direction of the motion after five seconds. Indicate the speed and direction of the object by drawing a labeled arrow next to the object. Okay, this is the object underneath. No resultant force, which means no change in motion. There we are, exactly the same as above. Question four. Figure 4.1 shows a smoke cell. The uh, cell contains smoke particles and air molecules. It is lit from the side. A student views the motion of the smoke particles in the cell by using a microscope. All right, so it's a Brownian motion experiment. Describe and explain what the student sees when viewing the smoke particles through the microscope. All right. So what will they see? Well, they're going to see, going to see bright specks of light reflected off smoke particles. They're going to see the bright specks are undergoing random and unpredictable motion as the air molecules collide with the smoke particles. And of course, this produces Brownian motion. Part B. Drops of water on a warm surface disappear after a short time. State the term used to describe this process. Explain the process and, uh, oh, using your ideas about molecules. So the name of the process, in this case, evaporation. You put some liquid on a surface and it vanishes. Because it's warm, then it's going to have evaporated off. Why does that happen? Well, molecules with a greater than average kinetic energy of the liquid escape from the water's surface. There we go. Question five. Figure 5.1 shows a geothermal power station that generates electricity. Uh, in a geothermal power station, the process of generating electricity includes seven stages. Four of the stages are shown below. So steam turns a turbine, hot underground rocks heat the cold water, the turbine spins a generator and hot water rises to the surface. So it looks like they're out of order. Uh, the flowchart shows the seven stages, but it's incomplete. Okay, so we're filling out a flowchart. Cold water is, pump, uh, is pumped down. That's our first bit there. And once it's been pumped down, we end up with Q. Hot underground rocks heat the cold water. So we've now got hot water. Hot water rises to the surface. Hot water produces steam, and steam turns a turbine, P, and finally R, the turbine spins a generator. There we go, and electricity is generated. The cost of electricity or electrical energy obtained from a geothermal power station is similar to the cost of electrical energy obtained from wind turbines. Describe one advantage and one disadvantage of using geothermal power station to generate electricity compared with wind turbines. Okay, well, advantage, you're not dependent on the weather for whether or not the rocks will be warm. It's much more predictable. So we have a continuous supply of heat. Certainly a predictable supply of heat. Disadvantage. Over time, the rocks can become cooler.
and that does happen. Six, a student constructs a device for absorbing thermal energy from the sun. Uh, this diagram shows a device. The student places uh, the white plastic pipe in sunlight. The cold water flows slowly from tank A to tank B using energy from the sun, which heats the water in the pipe. There we go. And here we see a couple of temperatures before and after. Determine the rise in temperature of the water. All right, well, this over here looks to be about 23 degrees Celsius. This one over here seems to be about 26 degrees Celsius. So the water rise will be 26 degrees Celsius minus 23 degrees Celsius, which is in fact 3 degrees Celsius. There we are, the units are already written in. Always pay attention to that. B. The student wants to increase the thermal energy absorbed by water in the pipe. Well, not using the white plastic pipe would be a good start. Suggest three improvements he can make to increase the thermal energy absorbed. Okay. Use dark slash black pipe instead. That's one possibility. Other possibility, use matte paint on it. Other possibility, but we'll transmit it much more effectively if it's a metal pipe. Anything else we can think of? Well, yeah, how about if the water moves more slowly? We'll spend more time in the pipe getting heated up. There's a bunch of possibilities. C. Describe how the thermal energy is transferred from the sun to the water inside the pipe. Ooh, interesting. Describe how. So we're wanting some specifics here. So we have the infrared radiation radiated from the sun. Remember, there are three types of energy transfer with heat. You've got conduction, convection, and radiation. So this is radiation. And then the warm pipe transfers heat to the water. That's conduction. Seven, the spectrum of white light is made up of seven colors. Uh, figure 7.1 shows a partially completed spectrum. Two labels are mit missing. All right, so let's look at that. Oh, this one is yellow. And this one is blue. That's our missing colours. That's our first part. On figure 7.1, indicate the direction of increasing wavelength for the spectrum. Draw an arrow in the box uh, below the spectrum of colours. OK. So increasing wavelength means decreasing energy. Increasing frequency would be increasing energy. So it's increasing wavelength, decreasing energy. And red has less energy than blue. There we are. B. A ray of red light strikes one face of a triangle glass prism. On figure 7.2, draw the ray, uh, path of the rays that travels along a glass prism and enters the air. So it's slowing down, which means it's going to bend towards the normal line. And then as it leaves, it's speeding up, so it's going to bend away from the normal line. There we are. It's going to do that. And just for reference, here, of course, is the normal line. Not my finest work, but does the job. When you're doing an exam, if you can, use a little ruler. Two, state the term used to describe what happens to the ray of red light as it enters and leaves the prism. Well, that is refraction. changing direction because it's changing speed. That's what refraction means, or what refraction is. Eight, this question is about measuring the speed of sound in air. A student stands in front of a large wall. She has a drum and hears an echo. Figure 8.1 shows the position of the student and the wall. Right, A, A1. Uh, state the name of the piece of equipment for measuring the distance from the student to the wall. Well, that's gonna be a tape measure. One of those big ones that the PE departments tend to have. There we go, it's a big old tape measure. 
and two, explain how sound forms an echo. Right. And two, explain how sound forms an echo. Well, sound from the drum is reflected from the wall back towards the student. B. The student hits a drum repeatedly once per second. She walks away from the wall and listens for an echo. When the student is 170 metres from the wall, she hears the echo from one beat of the drum at the same time as the next beat of the drum. Right. OK, so we know it's taking one second to go to the wall and come back. Use this information to determine the speed of sound. Ooh, state the unit. So the time it takes for the sound to travel to the wall and back is one second. Let's write that down. And of course we have our equation for speed. Speed equals distance over time. So as always we write down our working out. And the distance is going to be 2 times the distance to the wall divided by the time which is 1.0 seconds and that is 2 times 170 meters divided by 1.0 seconds which will give me 340 meters per second don't forget the units there we go all right question 9 we've got a partially labeled diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, A1, add the name of the missing radiations at A and at B. All right. Well, short Gavin executes. Unwelcome visitors in a mad rage. There we are. A2, indicate the radiation that has the lowest frequency. All right, lowest frequency means lowest energy. Draw a ring round the radiation. The lowest energy one is radio waves. And B, state two safety precautions when handling sources that emit gamma radiation. Oof. Well, let's see. Safety precaution number one, use metal tongs. Use a lead apron. If it has a direction, point it away from you. We can't really put anything like try not to handle it. <laughs> Don't run away. No, it's obviously not that dangerous if it's uh, carefully dealt with. But you wouldn't want to be in the same room as a gamma emitter at all anyway. No, if you've got an option. Question 10. Uh, we've got a circuit for determining the resistance of a component. Excellent. Part A. Label the fixed resistor by writing the letter R. R. That was easy. B. Two components measure electrical quantities. Well, the ammeter and the voltmeter, I imagine. Identify the quantity that each component measures. Write down each quantity in each unit in a correct place in the table. All right, let's see. Okay, so the component for the ammeter, it measures the current. And the unit of that is amps. The voltmeter measures the potential difference. And a unit of that is volts. OK, let's look at the next section. C. A student uses the circuit in figure 10 to determine the resistance of wires made from the same material. State how the resistance of a wire is related to its length and diameter. So length, well, as length increases, resistance increases. Diameter, well, as diameter increases, the resistance decreases. There we go. Question 11. Uh, shows a vertical conductor pass through a horizontal piece of card. And on that diagram, draw a cell and a switch in series with the conductor to form a complete circuit. All right. Start with our switch. There we go. And our cell. Pretty close together, but that should be fine. Key point whenever you draw these circuits, make sure the wires join together. If you leave a gap of more than about a millimetre, it's going to get marked wrong. 
They sound crazy, just make sure the lines join together, especially at the corners. Yeah, we've all done it, we've all made mistakes, we've all left gaps. Don't do it. All right, use the correct circuit symbols. Well, we've just done that. We've got a switch and our cell. Two, a student sprinkles iron filings onto the cards and closes the switch. There is current in the conductor. Describe the pattern of the magnetic field seen. Well, that's going to be circular around the wire. And three, the student reverses the direction of the current in the conductor. State the effect, if any, on the pattern he sees. All right, I'm assuming he turns the switch off, opens the switch, and then reverses the cell and closes the switch again. And at that point, you won't see any difference because the magnetic filings just line up and it'll be already in line. So it'll be no difference. B. Describe an experiment to show that a force acts on a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field. Show how to arrange the equipment. Include a diagram in your answer. Right. First thing we're going to need is a couple of magnets. We've got a north and a south. Over this end we're going to have... A south and a north. So we've got some lovely strong magnetic field lines between the two. We're going to put our wire in between those two parts. There we are. We're going to connect that up. We're going to just put a little switch in it. You know what we're going to do? Let's put a battery in there. There we are. So we get a good solid switch. We've got the wire in between the magnets. So let's label this. First of all, we have our wire in a strong magnetic field. Then we have a power supply or battery and a switch to open and close the circuit. We have two magnets. Let's call them strong magnets. It's not easy to see the results anyway. You do need some very strong magnets. Okay, so what happens? Well, when the current is switched on, the wire will move. And it will move in accordance with Fleming's left-hand rule. So if I just look at the circuit we have here, when it comes closed, we can see the electric current move in this direction all the way around here. So out of the large side into the small side, we can use Fleming's left-hand rule. First finger direction of the field, second finger the current, and we can see that the thumb will point upwards. So if the wire moves in accordance with Fleming's left-hand rule, in this case, it will move upwards. All right, question 12. Radioactive decay may include the emission of alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. From the list, which one has the greatest ionizing effect? Well, that is alpha particles. Which one has the lowest penetrating ability? That's alpha particles again. Very ionizing, which is why they don't move very far. B. In a factory, rows press aluminium metal together to make thin foil sheets. An automated system for controlling the thickness of the foil uses a radioactive source. The automatic system changes the gap between the top and bottom roller, and here we see the equipment. Use your ideas about the properties of radiation to suggest and explain the type of radiation used. Well, the type of radiation? That's going to be beta radiation. Because beta radiation is affected by the thickness of the foil. Alpha radiation would just stop and beta radiation would go through, especially if it's that thin. There we go. So beta radiation is affected by the thickness of the foil. 
too. The aluminium foil passing the radiation detector is too thin to scrape how this fault affects the reading on the counter. Well, it would read more beta radiation, so the reading will be higher. So just how the fault is corrected. State what happens. Well, the rows will move further apart. There's less pressure on them. And finally, part four, the source used is strontium-90. A nucleus of strontium-90 can be described as 9038 strontium. State the number of protons in a nucleus of strontium-90. Oh, that's nice. It's already given to us. That's the proton number. So the number of protons is 38. 38 protons. There we are. And that is the end of our test. So, job well done. Feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any particular papers that you want me to run through, just leave a comment in the section below. Have a lovely day.